Hello and welcome, I'm technically not a technician, and today's video will be discussing TechnoParrot. We'll talk about what TechnoParrot is, how it's used and set up, and at the end of the video, we'll review our overall thoughts on this powerful emulator. However, before we move forward, it's important to say that neither I nor this channel condone software piracy, and we cannot forget the following arbitrary legal requirements. This video is for educational purposes only, and is only intended to show you what I've done and what my results are. If you choose to modify your systems using this or any other information I've provided from any video or content I've created, you do so at your own risk. I, this channel, or any person connected to this video will not be held liable for any choices you make with your hardware or software. Modify at your own risk. Let's start with what TechnoParrot is. TechnoParrot is a popular emulator primarily designed to run modern arcade games on Windows PCs. A group of enthusiasts is actively developing it with the goal of preserving arcade games by making them playable on devices other than their original hardware. It is particularly known for emulating newer arcade titles that use PC-based hardware. The emulator is actively maintained and frequently updated to improve compatibility, add new features, and support additional games. TechnoParrot currently supports a wide range of arcade games, especially those PC-based arcade games from Sega, Namco, and Taito, among others. TechnoParrot offers robust controller support, allowing users to configure a variety of input devices such as gamepads, steering wheels, and custom arcade setups. For this video we'll be using an Xbox gamepad, as I believe most of you will have access to one or a gamepad that is similar. TechnoParrot is compatible with a wide range of arcade games, including but not limited to various Sega arcade games such as Initial D Arcade Stage, Sega Rally 3, and OutRun 2 SP. Namco titles like Mario Kart Arcade GP and Time Crisis 5. Taito titles like BlazBlue, Continuum Shift, and Darius Burst Another Chronicle. The list of supported games is continually expanding as the development team adds compatibility for more titles. It's important to note that while TechnoParrot itself is legal, downloading and using ROMs without proper ownership or permission is illegal in many jurisdictions. Users should ensure they are using ROMs legally obtained from their own arcade systems. Let's talk about the hardware we'll be using. As stated previously, I'll be using an old Xbox controller. In keeping with the spirit of using low-cost items you may have hanging around your house, we'll be using an old Elite Desk 800 series desktop. Because the hardware is of an older nature, I've installed Windows 10 Enterprise. This desktop is running an old generation 4 CPU. It is an i7 CPU, but keep in mind that as of making this video, the newest reiteration of the processor is the 14th generation. I've also added 16 gigs of DDR3 ROM that's running at 1333 MHz and an old GeForce GT 1080. Most of these parts have come to me second-hand, and the important thing to know is that many of the games emulated by the Techno Parrot will run well on this hardware. However, other games like Star Wars will need hardware with more power. This hardware was picked as an example of what can be done with older crap you may already have on hand. With the overview of the hardware we'll be using today out of the way, let's move to our PC and head to TechnoParrot's website. I believe it's important to note that if you want up-to-date information on what games are supported or how well a game runs, you're able to find that information in the compatibility section. They also seem to be active on Reddit and Discord, so if you require detailed information, you have the option to explore those areas as well. Let's talk about software. For some of us, this subject is a little scary, but I'm here to tell you not to fear. For TechnoParrot, we'll answer the software call by providing us with everything we need. To begin, we'll need a zip utility. I'll not be downloading and installing a zip utility today, as I already have one installed. I do recommend 7-Zip, which is linked here on the download page. If you don't have one, please feel free to download and install. We will need one, and 7-Zip is the one I'll be using for today's video. We'll also be downloading the TechnoParrot Bootstrapper. This is a download and installation utility that will automate some of the process of downloading and installing the TechnoParrot emulator for us. The last two items are support files. One is for DirectX, and the second is for Visual C++. It looks as if these support packages mostly consist of legacy versions of each software distribution. The important takeaway here is that we'll need these software distributions installed. 
If we do not, then some, if not all, of our arcade machines will not boot or load. Downloading these took me a total of 5 minutes. In the area where I live, we are having internet issues because of Hurricane Beryl. Before the storms, these three packages took less time to download. Your time will depend very much on your internet connection and the speed of your PC. The Technoparrot bootstrapper is sourced from the Technoparrot website, the DirectX package comes from a sketchy looking mega downloads link, and the Visual C++ package seems to come from an equally sketchy third-party redistribution website. I will, of course, be linking to these sketchy websites for your convenience, but download and use at your own risk. I do not maintain any of these links, nor am I affiliated with any of these websites in any way. Again, use at your own risk. Now that we've downloaded the emulator and needed supporting files, we'll need to use 7-zip to extract the compressed files. I'm going to start with our DirectX and Visual C++ files first, and to keep things simple, I'm going to extract both into subfolders inside my downloads folder. I'll also be deleting the zipped files after they've been extracted, as we'll not be needing them again. After the support files are extracted, we'll start installing them, starting with the DirectX files. Once inside the subfolder, you'll be confronted with a plethora of files. We'll be looking for the executable file called dxsetup.exe. Look for and open that installer. When you do, Windows will notify you that the application is attempting to make changes to your system. If you wish to move forward, simply tell the software, and the installation will continue. After which you should now get the Microsoft Terms and Conditions prompt. To move forward, click on Agree. After hitting Agree, the installer will continue with the automated system and install all of the DirectX software that Technoparrot recommends installing to support the emulator. Once the installer is done, you'll be given a finished prompt. Simply click on that prompt, and the installer will close. After closing the DirectX installer, we can delete the installation files and move our attention to the C++ subfolder. Here we want to locate the bat file labeled as install all, right click on the install all bat file, and run it as an admin. I do not normally condone running random bat files you find in sketchy locations, as this can have devastating consequences. However, I did look inside this one, and all seems okay to me. That said, I'm not a programmer, nor am I qualified to tell you if this is safe. So proceed at your own risk. After telling your PC to run the bat file as admin, you will get a prompt verifying that you do in fact wish to do so. If you wish to move forward with automation, click yes, and the bat file will install each of the C++ software packages one at a time. Once done, you can delete the install files, and we can move over to the main emulator itself. Next, we'll need to extract our bootstrapper, and I'll be doing so on the root of my drive in a folder simply called Technoparrot. Once the bootstrapper is extracted, we'll wish to navigate to the root of the drive and enter our Technoparrot folder to find our bootstrapper's executable file. After locating the bootstrapper executable file, run the program, where you will be immediately confronted with a Windows prompt letting you know this program will be making changes to your PC. If you wish to move forward click continue, and the bootstrapper will open, and you'll be asked where you would like to install your emulator. For this video, we'll be using the Technoparrot folder we made on the root of the C drive. Once done, you'll be given two options. You can download each of the sections at once, or you can download each section one at a time. I recommend clicking on the full install option, and if any of the sections fail, you can go back and download that section with the download section option. Again, when making this video, we got hit with a hurricane, and because of this, my internet is kind of crappy right now. This download took me a little over 7 minutes to do. However, in the past, it's been very fast. Your time will be different, and again, that time will be based on the speed of both your PC and your internet speed. Once the emulator is downloaded and installed, you'll be given a prompt letting you know everything is successful. Simply click OK on that prompt, and when done, you'll immediately get a second prompt telling you that this looks as if it is the first time you've launched this emulator, and you'll first need to set the emulator up. Again, click OK on this prompt, and because repetition is fun, we'll get a third prompt. This third prompt will inform us that we've got no games set up and ask if we'd like to add some. Again, please click OK to continue. Technoparrot will now launch, and the very first order of business is checking for updates, and because of how active updates are provided with Technoparrot, we do get informed that we have an update available. 
Because we have an update available to us, let's activate and install the update by navigating to the hamburger menu at the top left corner and clicking on it. When we do so, a new menu is presented, and the first menu option is Install Updates. Make that selection. After making our selection, we'll be confronted with a new prompt, informing us of what updates we have available, and at the bottom right corner of that prompt, we'll have an option to download and apply those options. Once you've located that option, click on it, and the download and update will start. This update took about 4 minutes for me, and I believe it took this long because of the weather and condition of the communication lines at the time this work was being conducted. When you update, your time will be different, and it will be based on the PC you're using and the quality of the internet connection. I also feel as if this is an appropriate time to speak about how often the software prompts you for updates. Basically, daily, I am not exaggerating, I can't think of a day that I've started Technoparrot and I've not had an update. Sometimes it feels like I may have had two updates in a single day, however, that feeling could be me just bugging. Regardless, the updates have yet to break any of the games I've set up nor has it limited my overall experience. Because of this, I do recommend applying the updates when offered. I'd also like to say that if you like this kind of content, then please consider subscribing to the channel and liking this video. Each click helps. Thank you. After Technoparrot updates itself, the program will restart, and you'll again see the prompt informing you that you've got no game set up and asking if you'd like to set some up. If we click yes, we'll be brought to an area that lists all of the games that work with our emulator, and if we go back into the menu and click library, we'll again get the same prompt informing us that we've got no game set up. So let's try to fix that. For now, let's exit Technoparrot, and let's add a folder to the root of the Technoparrot directory called ROMs. This folder will act as the area that will house the ROM or program files of each of the arcades that Technoparrot emulates, and we'll need to place all of our ROM files for each of the arcades inside this folder. I've pre-downloaded a few test ROMs ahead of time, this will help us cut down on time, and before you ask, I can't link to or provide you with these game files. You'll have to find those for yourself. For today's video, I've picked 7 different games to test, but before we can use these arcade ROMs, we'll need to extract them into our ROMs folder. Yes you heard that right. Unlike MAME or Final Burn Alpha, these ROMs must be extracted into a subfolder, and we'll also need to point the emulator to each ROM executable, but we'll have more on that later in the video. For now, simply open the ROMs compressed file and extract the content of that compressed file into the ROMs folder we made inside the Technoparrot folder on the root of our C drive. We'll need to continue this process for each game, one at a time, until each compressed file has been extracted into the Technoparrot ROMs folder. Also, and I'm not sure what's going on, it seems that I have two Contra games from my ROMs download, but the emulator seems to only have one listed in the emulator software. So instead of seven games to test today, let's make it six games that we'll be testing. The size of each of these games will be different, as some games are simple and others are more complex. I've seen ROMs with a footprint of only a few megabytes and others that were several gigabytes. I think it's important to remember that after you've extracted your compressed files into your ROMs folder, you are able to delete the original compressed files to help save space as they are no longer needed, and again, some of these ROMs can be a few gigs in overall size. I'll now plug in my controller and use the built-in Windows USB controller tool to make sure that my PC is seeing it and that all of the buttons are functioning as they should. Based on what I'm seeing, everything seems to work well. All of my buttons are working, and my analog controllers all seem to register. This tells me that the emulator should have access to this controller. I'll now exit the USB controller tool, and we'll now head back over to the Technoparrot executable. Once here, I'll start Technoparrot again, and I'll be confronted with a prompt reminding me that I need to set up some of the ROMs. Click OK, and we're again met with the list of games that work with Technoparrot. Looking at the ROMs in my collection, I believe I'd like to give Rampage a try. I've not played this version, and I'm curious how it will play. To make this happen, I'll locate Rampage on the Technoparrot list and simply click on the Add Game option from under the game icon on the center right. Once the game is added, we're given a submenu to this newly added game, and if we look under the game icon on the right, we'll see a few options we can pick from. The first option that needs some changes will be game settings. When we click on that option, we'll see an area at the top that is asking us for an executable for the ROM that we've selected, and it has the name of the executable in brackets. In this case, the executable will be called game.exe. If we click on the highlighted line under this verbiage, 
we will be asked to locate the requested game executable. Here we'll want to navigate to our TechnoParrot folder on the root of our drive, find the ROMs folder, and locate the Rampage ROM folder. Once in the Rampage ROM folder, look for and find the game.exe executable and select it. This action tells the emulator what file it needs to boot to start this ROM. I'd like to pause for a second and point out that the options in the game setting area will be different for each ROM. This, I believe, is due to each loaded arcade being different, and each machine that is loaded having different options. In this case, we picked Rampage, a simple game, and its options seem to reflect that. The only items we can change in this game are the aforementioned executable, the type of controller we have connected, and if we wish to start in window mode. Each ROM will be different. We will next need to tell the emulator what buttons on our keyboard and controller we wish to use to control this game. When working with this emulator, I've noticed that you're unable to use analog controls as buttons, nor are you able to use buttons as analog controls. This may or may not be an issue for you, but know that if you want to use your analog stick in place of the D-pad, that doesn't seem to be an option as far as I can tell. I also feel compelled to tell you that if none of your inputs are registering, then you may wish to change the controller input type under the game settings. Those are the only two issues I've had when setting up a ROM in this section, and registering each of the actions to a key is very simple. All you need to do is click on the action, and then press a key on your keyboard or game controller to tie that action to a button. I'll be using the 0 and 9 buttons on my keyboard for the test and service buttons. I'll then use my select for coins, my start for the player start button, the D-pad to navigate my player around the screen, and the A button to attack. Let's test this game configuration and verify that all is working as expected. To do so, let's simply click on the launch game and see what we can expect. When you launch a game in TechnoParrot, you'll get a TechnoParrot terminal giving you a little information on what is going on. TechnoParrot will give you an update on what the process is doing and if it has been successful or not. If it is successful, you'll get a message telling you to enjoy your game, and I think that's very nice of them to offer. But when does the game start? In truth, each game is different, and the more complex the game, the longer it will take for it to boot up. Rampage, again, is a simple game, and because of its simplicity, it doesn't take very long for it to boot and is ready for a new game. Astute viewers will have noticed that we programmed a test and service button in the control area. Please remember that the software is emulating a full-sized arcade. All of the configuring we've done so far is for the emulator, and some of the arcade ROMs will have options that can, or must be adjusted in-game. For example, if you wanted to set the game to free play or adjust the difficulty level, you would do so using these controls. That said, Rampage seems to play well, and I think we can move on to the next game. To exit a game, we simply need to press the escape key and that will back us out into our game screen. Now that we have a game added, if we navigate to the game library section and click on it, we'll no longer get a prompt asking us to load games, but now we'll always be sent to the list of games we have available to ourselves. With that in mind, let's add more to our library. Next, let's do Mario Kart, and to do so, let's do just as we did with Rampage and navigate to the supported game section and find our entry, but this time, let's look for Mario Kart. Once you've located Mario Kart, you'll note that we have two options for this game. One that stands out with the word subscription next to it. Basically, in this case, we have two versions of the game. One is a standalone version, and the other is made to work on a centralized server of some kind. I do not subscribe to those services, so I do not have much experience with that option. Note that there are two, and be sure that you use the right version for your setup. As you can see, Mario Kart, being a larger, more popular, and more robust game, has a lot of options to work from. All game ROMs that I've worked with have the first three options. The executable, input API, and windowed options seem to be in all TechnoParrot ROMs. However, the other options seem to differ per game, and each game, for the most part, seems to have different sets of options, from my experience. For the most part, I keep most options as default, with the exception of the two resolution options. More often than not, I do change the resolution options to match those of my desktop settings. For most of us, using a resolution set at 1920 for the width and 1080 for the height will meet our needs, as this is a fairly standard resolution that most monitors should be able to meet. For today's video, I'll keep the resolution at the default settings. Next, we'll tell the emulator where the executable file is, and just as before, we've given a hint as to what the name of the executable is in the brackets. 
We'll also turn off windowed mode, and when we're done making changes, we'll click on the save settings options. For the Mario Kart controller, we'll be doing the same as we did for the Rampage. However, this arcade cab will be using different controls. The action buttons to play the Rampage game only consisted of a D-pad and a single attack button. Mario Kart will need an analog steering wheel and analog controls for both the gas and the brake. We will need buttons for other options, but remember, with this emulator, you are unable to use buttons as analogs or analogs as buttons. Everyone will wish to do their controls differently, but as far as my main navigation controls, I'll be using the triggers and left stick to race about. This is done the same way, and as I said before, I use the 0 and 9 buttons on my keyboard as test and service, and all the action buttons will come from my game controller. Once done, save your controller setting, and let's launch a game. You should, at this time, be getting a Technoparrot terminal, and shortly after, your cab should load. It will take a minute, but it should load. I say should, because this time I was unable to get the game working, and I say this time because I've gotten this to run three other times on three other computers. I'm unsure as to why it didn't work this time, but after about four minutes of troubleshooting, I figured I'd just move on. Yeah, basically, I got bored. For what it's worth, it could be hardware or something as simple as me copying over a corrupt file. Regardless of what the issue is, let's move on to another racing game. This time we'll be trying a game based on the popular Hanna-Barbera cartoon, Wacky Races. I've also come to learn that this was a Dreamcast game. However, other than the cartoon, Technoparrot is my first introduction to Wacky Races as a video game. Just as we did for our last two games, we'll select Add Games from the hamburger menu, then we'll navigate to the Wacky Races game, and under the corresponding icon to the right we'll select Add Game. When done, click on Game Settings, and for this game, I'm going to turn off Window Mode, and then I'll select the executable file that is associated with this game. As far as the input, I'll be leaving it as it works with my Xbox controller. After making our selections, save the new settings, and we'll get kicked back into the main menu. We next need to set up our controller, and to do so, we again click on the controller setup option that's below our arcade icon. This will open up the controls menu, and as before, I'll use the 0 and 9 buttons on my keyboard for the test and service functions. The coin action will be linked to the select button, and player 1 will be paired with the start button. Just as I tried with the Mario Kart, I'll use the x-axis on my left stick as the steering wheel, my right trigger as the gas, and my left trigger as my brake. Both triggers are analog, and the change view and lever will be the A and B buttons. After saving the settings, let's launch Wacky Races and see if we can get this arcade running and playable. Each arcade cab will need a second to boot, and just as with the popular emulator main, when booting a machine, you may get a boot screen from the cab. This is normal and a good sign. Each boot screen should also be different for each game, so it looks as if the good news is we're able to boot Wacky Races but is it playable? I think we should test it, but just a little and only to find out how playable it is. I have a ton of nostalgia for Hanna-Barbera cartoons, and I remember wacky races from my personal Saturday morning indulgence as a child. From the limited tests I've done, I can say that this plays well out of the box and without fine-tuning the controls at the cab level. I was able to insert a coin, select a player, and start the game without any issue. I do recommend that before you do any real gaming, you not only configure the emulator and the controls for the emulator but also configure and fine-tune the controls in each game before any serious playing. That said, this title played so well that I was unable to help myself, and I seem to have played the full game. What can I say, I'm a little nostalgic for anything Hanna-Barbera. Did I mention I took first place? Because I totally rocked this race and was able to take the gold. I don't know if you've ever played this game, but it's a great racing game the whole family can enjoy. After launching games that seem to have networking capabilities, like racing, you will get a security notification. This is normal, and after you respond appropriately, you will not get that message again. You do not find this on all games, and after you respond, you'll not have to worry about this prompt the next time you launch this game. The next game we'll load is a much smaller game called Radical Bikers. This game caught my eye in the game compatibility list, as it says third-party emulator in brackets on the title. After loading this game, I believe I remember it, but I'm not sure where I know it from. This ROM will be configured the same, as we'll need to point the emulator to the executable, however, there seems to be a setup screen option. For today's video, we'll just turn that off, as I've tested it out. 
It's simply a way to set the screen resolution from within the arcade cab, and we don't need to make any adjustments at this time. Regardless, when we're done making our adjustments, we hit save and get kicked back out into the game menu. We'll also configure this racing game the same as we've done the others. Again, I like using the 0 and 9 buttons on my keyboard for the test and service buttons, but that's just me. Feel free to use what works best for you. I do want to point out that the gas and the brake on this cab are not analog, so I'll be unable to use the triggers on my Xbox to start and stop, and I'll be programming those on the A and B buttons. The steering on this unit is still analog, and just as we've done in our past controls, I'll be using the x-axis of my left stick to steer my racer. Again, I can't remember where I've seen this game, but I think I'll look for it on MAME. After we've saved the controls, we'll again launch the game to test it. To save time, I'm just going to jump into the demo. As you can see, the game plays smoothly. Other than where the gas and the brake are located now on my controller, it feels just as nice as the controls for the wacky racer. I also want to say that before any serious gameplay, you will want to adjust the in-game cab controls too. I'll not be making those adjustments in this video, as they will be different for each cab, and we are limited on time. For our next demo, let's do Contra. If you're around my age and you had a NES, then there is a high chance that you played Contra a ton of times, and you may even have the cheat code that gives you 30 players still memorized. For those of you who still have that golden code memorized, I salute you. With the game added, we'll navigate to the game settings, and when selected, you can see we have our normal array of options, with a custom resolution option and additional options to adjust the resolution of the width and the height. For this demo and in this section, I'll only be making changes to the executable, and when I'm done, I'll save those changes. We'll again configure the controls on this unit, and as you can see, the test and service buttons are different on this unit. I'll be doing the test button as zero on this, but all the other buttons, I'll map to my controller. You'll also see that this has a player 2 listing and is asking to have those controls configured. I will not be doing so, but if you'd like and have a second controller, you could do two players on this emulator in this game. After configuring the controls and saving the bindings, you'll learn a very dark secret. I perform poorly at Contra. In truth, and from what I can tell, this game plays well and has no issues. I'm just not very good at this game. Because my gameplay is so poor, we'll move on. Now let's try a light gun game on the Xbox controller, and for our light gun game, let's try the classic Alien Extermination. Alien Extermination was released in 2006, I believe, and overall seems like a solid game. When adjusting the game settings, we'll point the emulator to the game's executable, and you will find a helpful hint in the form of the name of the needed executable in brackets next to its corresponding section. Most importantly, in this section, we'll need to change the selection in the input section from raw input to direct input to make these controls work with our Xbox controller. Be sure to make that change, then save your settings. After verifying that you do have the input type changed to direct input, you'll need to configure the controller and bind the controls. This is done just as you've done with the other systems. However, this time you'll configure both the X and Y axis. For myself, I'll be using the left stick for my X and Y axis. The triggers on the cab are not analog, they are standard buttons, so I'll be configuring my gun trigger, my gun special, and my flame trigger to the A, B, and X buttons on my controller. Please feel free to bind as you wish and use what works for you. The boot screen of Alien Extermination seems different than the other cabs. It's a bit larger and has a full screen. You also get a loading percentage as the game readies. Overall, I was very impressed with how well this game runs. I figured that out of any of the games I'd be demoing today, this would be the one that would give me issues. For total transparency, the emulation of this game seems to be fantastic. I would guess that the controls would react better if I took the time to configure them in the machine settings, but because each cab is different, I feel as if that may be a little time consuming. Again, I'm very impressed with the game emulation, and I can report that on this old 4th generation CPU and used hardware, we're able to get very smooth gameplay from this ROM on this emulator. In short, the game runs well, it's fun to play, and it took me no time to configure once I understood how it all worked. So, what are my final thoughts on this emulator? Overall, I like it. Techno Parrot offers a great selection of arcade games that I've found hard to find in the wild. There are a few titles that I'd love to see come to this emulator, and I wish a few more titles would play well on the hardware that I personally have available. 
The options in the game setting area that you have control over for each game are always different. I'd like to see more options for each game, maybe some standardization, but for me, as long as each game runs well, I'm happy. I enjoyed learning about each of these cabs and testing out each game. I've got to say that this emulator plays well. There are a few small issues on some of the games. Wacky Races, the game I'm demoing right now, for example, seems to have an issue with the aspect ratio and scaling of the menu. But other than a few small issues, this emulator is very solid, the gameplay is great, and I'd recommend giving this system a try. If you've made it this far, then I'd like to thank you for checking out my video. I hope you enjoyed it and found it informative. If you'd like to support the channel, then please hit that like button and turn on notifications. Please feel free to leave me a comment, I love hearing from you all. And if you've not done so yet, please consider subscribing. All of these actions help me beat the YouTube algorithm, and your help is greatly appreciated. If you'd really like to support this channel, you're always welcome to leave me a tip on buy me a coffee or send me a super thanks right from YouTube. Everything that comes into the channel goes back into the content, and we, of course, thank you for your support.